This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, well, welcome everyone. So, um, this is an Extreme Energy Initiative Human Rights Schools Awarding event, and we're delighted to have for the second time Dr. Marianne Murray Smith, Senior Policy Advisor at the National Toxic Network. Uh, from Australia, and we're going to hear about extreme energy, but more, more specifically underground coal gasification as well. So, without further ado, can I see Marianne? Oh, yeah, it's yeah, time to hurry up. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Lovely to see you all here. Thank you. We should hope it will be worthwhile and be useful for you. As Damien has just said, it's a discussion of extreme energy, and we titled it A Message from Down Under. Um, I think it's rather ironic that nearly a century ago, Lenin described it as the greatest victory of technology because it was going to protect the workers, they weren't going to go down the mines, lives weren't going to be lost. But 100 years later, the residents of southeast Queensland have called it Syngas, the energy from hell. And I think my presentation will probably show you why that's so. So just to start off, what is underground coal gasification? I think the important thing that people have to understand is in situ, that it's remotely carried out, underground, anywhere up to 800 metres underground, and in non-mined coal seams to produce what they call product gas, which is nicknamed syngas. Now, we do know in China there is some underground coal gasification happening in old mines, but unfortunately, being in China, it's been very, very hard to get any data on that. The syngas is a mixture of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, and a range of hydrocarbons. And the ratios vary according to the coal seam that's being burned, and according to the depth of the um, actual combustion. Um, to get the fire going, you start with ignition agents like propane or ammonium nitrate fuel oil, which are pretty unpleasant things in themselves, and then you eject air and steam and carbon dioxide to try to sustain and control the combustion. But I think the really important thing to understand is this is not an exact science, and if you can imagine trying to control a combustion when you're so deep underground, remotely, it's extremely difficult. So basically, the combustion converts the carbon in the coal to CO2 and heat, and then the secondary actions take that CO2 and form carbon monoxide, hydrogen gas, and methane. And there's a couple of different ways to do it. That probably is a diagram of the most simple. One well in, one well out. But then there's a lot of talk about more modern ways of doing this, as if the more modern ways resolve some of the problems. And this is this thing called controlled retraction injection point. And basically, you have three wells there. But still, it's the same, simply the same thing. You have combustion underground, and you take out the gas. But to get the gas to flow, and it's something people don't really understand, from the combustion zone to the production well, you have to facilitate that. And in many cases, you use hydraulic fracturing, the same sort of fracking as we talk about when we talk about shale or coal seam gas. There's also explosive fracturing, which doesn't sound real good, and directional drilling. So the different forms of underground coal gasification use the different forms of um, facilitating the gas flow. While the gases are extracted, Unfortunately, everything else, like the solid char, the ashes, they remain down there. So you have this sort of incredible cavity which has formed, which has then got a layer of these rather nasties, which carry a whole lot of contaminants with them. The other thing that's probably the most important is that you have to decommission the combustion chamber. You've got to basically put out the fire. And that's, what's, you know, that's where we've come to a real problem in Australia. And when you put out the fire, you reduce the temperature, and you go through that temperature area of, I think it's 250 to about 700 centigrade degrees, where you then form things like the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxins and furans, the benzene, toluene, and phenyls. And these are a bunch of some very, very serious 
toxins and very persistent ones as well. If you succeed to put out the fire, you then must remediate the cavity. And they do that by actually reducing the pressure and allowing the groundwater to come into the cavity and then trying to pump that out, which of course is a, a major waste issue. And then the cavity is filled with the coal rubble and quite often the collapsed overburden, the, the actual substance, um, and of course groundwater. There is a market for syn gas, but the type of syn gas that most markets have used are where you burn coal in an actual um, above ground chamber. But to use the syn gas, you've got to remove a range of things like sulphur and the particulates and the tar. And to do that, they use a range of industrial chemical processes as well as thermal processes and physical treatments. So it's quite a long process from getting the gas out to being able to use it, you know, either to be burned for energy or production of liquid fuel, and I'll come back to that because that's one of the ones that they have done in Australia, or for the manufacture of chemicals um, and production of hydrogen. I have heard in the UK, but I'm sure you will know more about this than I do, that if you were using the syngas for chemical production, you will not be required to remove and deal with the CO2 because the process provides a huge amounts of CO2. But that's just sort of a diagram of some of the things that you must go through. I think when it was sold to people, it was the idea is you just took the gas out of the ground and you immediately popped it off to a, a gas turbine and it became you know, energy overnight and nothing could be further from the truth. So the Australian experience. We have had three pilot projects, Carbon Energy, which started in 2008, and in 2010, it was charged for, by, was charged for releasing contaminated water into a nearby creek. It was fined, and it would have to start decommissioning by 2012. Cougar Energy, it started up in 2010, and I think lasted a matter of days and weeks before it was closed down because it contaminated the groundwater with benzene. And it's been fined quite a reasonable amount for leaking benzene into the groundwater. Both of those are in the stage of decommissioning. And then we have Link Energy, which I will focus on mainly here. It functioned for about 14 years. Um, it is also being decommissioned now. It trialled five different gasification processes and operations and it appears that every one of them was a dismal failure. It also developed a gas to liquid plant where you produce sin fuel from your sin gas. Um, that started up in 2008 with some rather unfortunate uh, results. They're just from the photos of the carbon energy and Huga energy facilities. Again, you know, they're not, they're not sort of discrete little facilities, they're quite uh, obvious on the landscape and, and particularly as they're only trials. So what did we learn from our three uh, attempts at underground coal gasification? Well we learned air pollution was a major issue, there is the risk of groundwater contamination, soil contamination, subsidence of the overlying terrain and climate change exacerbations. As I said, it produces a lot of toxic combustion byproducts and residues, things like ash and fennels and benzene that we've talked about, and they are able to leach into the groundwater. We also learned that it increased the solubility of the heavy metals because of the par partial combustion, the partial oxidization. These became much more able to um, become soluble in the water and move away and uranium and thorium, which are, are both components of gas. Um, in Australia, they sit at about four parts per million. I think it's about the same in the UK coal as well. Um, they are also mobilized. And we also learned that the natural fractures and the joints and the cleats in the coal provided perfect pathways for the water and the gas migration off-site. So there is definitely relatively high contaminant mobility with this industry. 
We also know, I don't think we learned this, but we certainly know that um, there are climate impacts from this. It produces massive amounts of CO2, which of course is a greenhouse gas that contributes to climate. Um, and although the industry has talked here in the UK about going deeper, and maybe if the combustion was done at a deeper level, there wouldn't be as many problems, the deeper you go with underground core gasification, the more CO2 you form. So it really is swapping one problem for another. We also learned that there is huge amounts of wastewater and solid wastes. Both the liquid effluence from the gas scrubbing, the liquid effluence from the actual decommissioning of the cavity. There's the particulates, the dissolved gases, the salts and the hydrocarbons. And I will come back to the experience of uh, LINK, which will show you this is exactly what we've um, resulted in. There's a lot of sludge, of course, when you clean the water. You're left with these residues that you've then got to deal with and what's happening to those. And, of course, the gaseous effluents. Again, these are just aerial photos of the facilities, so you get a sort of a feel for what they look like because they are being sort of proposed as being very discreet. It all happens underground, so you won't see it. Well, you know, these are the pilots. You can imagine what the uh, full-scale projects are like. So we'll get on to LINK. When LINK started up its uh, gas-to-liquid um, facility in about 2008, the issue of air pollution, which is lovingly called the Link's Big Stink in Australia, really came to light. The farmers around that region were desperate. They, they literally could not farm because the smell was so bad. It affected their breathing. It effect, gave them headaches. And Link's response was to offer air conditioners and a confidentiality agreement. Um, as good Australians, they told Link what they could do with their air conditioners and their confidentiality, and probably that's not, you know, repeatable. <laughs> but this whole idea of the air pollution doesn't seem to be really dealt with or discussed when you talk with the industry. They focus on the water, but they are not focusing on the fact that they are producing masses of carbon monoxide, NOx, nitrogen, um, oxides, the CO2s and the volatile organic compounds. And that is from all stages, right from construction and transport, through to the flaring, through to the venting, right through to um, the remediation and decommissioning. And the industry know this because when you look at the proposals for the South African UCG facility, in that proposal they say quite clearly, based on available data, construction and operation of the proposed UCG facility will impact negatively on the local ambient air quality. So it's known, it's just not discussed and um, somewhat uh, disingenuous. That's the flare from um, Cougar Energy. As you can see, they're big flares, they go all the time and uh, also produce a huge amount of contaminants. We were very lucky this year, a study, the first study I've really seen on the waste came out in 2015, this year it was an Australian study, and it reviewed the UCG wastewater and the UCG sludge from the facilities. Now we don't know exactly which facilities because the study was um, undertaken at the waste treatment facility area, so probably it was wastewater and sludge from either one, two or three of the pilots. But certainly there was an issue with a highly objectionable odour from the water and the sludge. The water was contaminated with significantly high concentrations of benzene, hydrocarbon and phenols, and the sludge had even higher concentrations. The phenols are a major issue because they're mutagenic, which they haven't been classified as carcinogenic yet, but if you have a mutating um, chemical, you have a great possibility that it could also be cancer causing. But it damages the liver and the kidneys and central nervous system as well. And of course, benzene is a known human carcinogen linked to leukemia, particularly in children. It's immunotoxic, causes birth defects. Basically, it's an all round nasty, one of the worst. And this industry produces tons of it. 
Um, again, that's just an aerial of carbon energy, I think, that one. You can see the large holding ponds where the water goes um, and before it gets transported to a facility for treatment, of course, leaving lots of the sludge there. And the relevance of that, I'll come back to in a second. So, in 2013, I think the Queensland Government set up an independent scientific panel. And they did this because they knew they were getting into trouble with these facilities. If you set up three facilities and you've got two already charged for polluting under the Environmental Protection Act, you know you have a problem. And so they set up this um, inquiry and the panel very sensibly came out with a number of uh, recommendations and probably the most important one was there should be no further commercialisation, no further ignition of any more panels of coal until the companies could prove they could put out the fire and decommission without contaminating the groundwater. That is where we're sitting at the moment in Australia. So there is no commercialisation at the moment. Um, there is some hope, I think, by uh, carbon energy that they will get permission at some stage in the future, but they certainly have not proven that they can decommission and remediate safely. So litigation against Link Energy. Now remember the other two have already been charged and fined and pleaded guilty. Link Energy now has four charges of alleged contamination of the environment from this UCG facility. The fifth charge happened this year and they were charged with willfully and unlawfully causing serious environmental harm, irreversible damage to the atmosphere, vegetation, soil and water. These are incredibly serious charges. There's also a number of alleged unreported incidents, that is that they had had fires and leaks. When you speak to the workers there, they talk about areas around the link site where the methane is literally bubbling out of the ground. They had nicknames for these bubblers, you know, the great bubbler and all these incredible names. The, how they got to the stage of litigation is that the Queensland Government uh, started or brought in consultants to do a report on the contamination and so far that report has cost the taxpayer $6.5 million and we haven't even got to court yet. So as you can imagine, the litigation is going to cost us big money for what? Part of that investigation started to, um, they created 230 bores and they started to test it out air, water and soil. And they found carcinogenic, volatile organic compounds over an incredibly wide area. They also found explosive levels of hydrogen and methane in the soil and the concern was that the contaminants in the soil would expose, or farmers would be exposed to those in just normal agricultural activities. There's also a lot of concern now because of the amount of nit uh, nitrogen oxides about the acidification of cropping land, which affects crops and affects the way farmers can use their land. That's one of their conclusions, that the degree of the contamination is widespread, of high impact and in part irreversible. It pervades a high, an area of high conservation value and what's really important is not just on the link site, but it is now spread, very widespread, and that no other activity or source of hydrogen or any of the other contaminants in the vicinity could explain the contamination they've found. And that just gives you a bit of a visual um, of the area that they're now talking as an excavation caution zone. So in March 2015, as um, Link still has these incredible pretty views of lights and, and uh, flares and happy workers, as you can see, they look jolly workers. But in actual fact, that is very far from the truth. A number of the workers have been affected, their health. They're, there's a couple of court cases now going through for workers' health. They're suffering everything from bleeding noses through to respiratory ailments. But the difficulty was the staff have all been forced to sign confidentiality agreements, which means it's very, very difficult for them to discuss some of these issues. 
and of course Link has denied all allegations and um, has refused the extra $22 million for cleanup um, of likely dioxin contaminants in the storage dam. But I think the worst case was earlier this year when the government inspectors went out to do some testing. A number of them were hospitalised with suspected carbon monoxide poisoning just by actually testing the soil. So the upshot of this is that we now have a 314 square kilometre exclusion zone where farmers cannot dig deeper than two metres, which, you know, the, we shouldn't joke about this, but the joke is when the poor farmer wanted to bury his dead pig, which was quite large and quite smelly, and he wanted to dig quite deeply, you know, you can't, you just cannot. They can't put more bores down, and unfortunately I just heard today one of the farmers who was affected by this found it all too much and has committed suicide. So the effect on the 40 or so families that live in this region and try to farm in this region has been totally tragic. Um, we have met with a number of the farmers saying, look, this is not something that can be cleaned up. This is, as the uh, found, irreversible. And so really the only way they are going to manage is to fight for buyout, move on and try to try to start up elsewhere. But of course, if you've had a property in many generations in your family, that's the last thing you want to do. But it is very, very tragic. It's a, a, a terrible outcome. So I'm going to just sort of leave it there, except I thought I'd end with that photo. If you wonder what it is, he is an Australian rock star, you can tell by the dreadlocks. <laughs> He's on his surfboard and he is, and with his gas mask, and he is surfing down the Condamine River, which is a river that many, many thousands of people depend on for their drinking water source. It goes through the gas fields and it goes through this area that Link Energy appears to have contaminated. And the bubbles. The bubbles are methane. The bubbles are methane. This stunt forced the Queensland government to go in and do a full inquiry. And what they are saying quite clearly is the methane that is being detected at the river at quite high levels, extraordinarily high levels. It was about 80% the lower explosive level, which, believe me, is high. Um, is exactly the same methane that is being mined. So this is not a natural event. And that sort of damage to a river, to the base of the river, will have effects for many, many generations. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.